The book is titled History of Names, and it was, for all practical purposes, my dissertation for my PhD. So it's all of the poems that I wrote while I was in graduate school, probably about seven or eight years of poetry. And there are some newer poems that I'll also be reading that aren't in the book that I've written over the last two or three years while I was teaching at Creighton. And a lot of the poems are family poems about especially my grandmother and my great-grandmother who were very important in my formative years. Uh, a lot of poems about my, my parents and my nephews. My book is um, dedicated to my nephew Todd, who is a writer his, himself now. He's written short stories and some poems, and at his school they, they can bind the books. So he has, he told me once that he was more published than I was. <laughs> He's 11. <laughs> Um, writing about my family draws sort of a connection. It's my own family tree. My grandmother has the family tree traced back to Ireland, and she can tell me the names and dates, and she tells me stories about these people, and I want them to be more than names and dates, so I write poems about them and draw the connections between my history and my present. And some of the poems deal with that, History of Names especially, which is the title poem of the book, deals with that and it's telling the stories about my ancestors, people that I didn't know, but I feel I know through listening to the stories of my grandmother and my great-grandmother. And my great-grandmother taught me how to crochet, and so every time I make an affigan, or not that I'm capable of finishing an affigan, but I make crochet something, that's a connection to her. The new poem I wrote for the reading tonight is called Quilting, and it's about a patchwork quilt my grandmother made me and drawing those sorts of connections. And so what I'm trying to do in my poetry is, is make a connection, draw a bridge between the past and the present. And hopefully going on to the future, I, I want my nephews to grow up and read the book and know about their history through that. Hi. I thought I would start out with a new poem, a poem I wrote just last night for the reading today. And it's called Quilting. Before she died, grandmother sewed for me a patchwork quilt from scraps left over. This one from a jumper she made me the summer I broke my arm and couldn't get the cast through shirt sleeves. She tied it all with different colored strings, and her love is tied in every knot. Even now, I wrap up in the quilt and feel her love surround me from beyond the grave. Each year before she dies, Grandmother Earth creates a patchwork quilt. The trees turn red and golden satin on the harlequin hills, and the milo fields are rusted corduroy. Strings of blackbirds tie a knot across the seam-edged roads, and even though the breeze is cooler now and often from the north, I feel a comfort that will last throughout the grave of winter. To, um, Go along with that slightly, I'll read the title poem of my collection, History of Names, which deals with stuff like grandmothers. The History of Names has a, an unusual anecdote about it. My name is Tamara, which is a reasonably unusual name, and when I got down to the university and started giving readings, people would always say, how do you pronounce your name? And I had no idea. I called my father long distance and said, how do you pronounce my name? And he said, Tammy. And I said, no, no, the long name, the full one. And he said, oh, I don't know. So I had to make something up myself. The story I heard was when I was a baby in the hospital, my mother wanted to name me Tammy, and my dad didn't think that sounded impressive enough. So he came in with his little notepad and his pen and wrote all of the names you could get Tammy out of and like Tamara and all the different ways you could spell it and like the O in the middle, and then no one ever called me that. So I thought about the way other people get named, which is after grandparents or aunts or uncles, and so this is history of names, and I suppose it's the history of other people's names. Names handed down connect generations. 
But in my time, people are named for poetry, not history. Tamara, Terry, Sybil, Shauna, Sue, pretty names without a past. My grandmother and I walk through the cemetery. She tells me the names on the tombstones. Sarah Nevada Wilsey, my great-great-grandmother, named for her grandmother, Sally, was born in a covered wagon crossing the Sierra Nevada mountains. In the photo album, she looks stern and somber, sitting in the fold-up rocking chair that leans against my mother's living room wall now. Matilda Jane Murphy. I remember my great-grandmother, Mom Murphy, named for her grandmother, Matilda. Morning, she would bring me sweet, smooth oatmeal and steaming strong Irish tea when I spent the night with her watching wrestling on TV. Ella Catherine Nicholas. My great-aunt Catherine made wedding cakes for everyone in the county and beyond. Her tractor found the only patch of ice on the country road and turned her over into a ditch. She was named for her great-grandmother, Catherine Jane Walters. Only 13 when she married, more like a child herself, she would play all day in the fields with the children and forget to start supper for her husband. As I drive my grandmother home, I know I could never find that cemetery again or those headstones her flowers find so easily. My children must be named for their history. Welcome, Matilda, Sarah, Catherine. Welcome to your past. My nephews, Todd and Kurt, are not actually named after anyone, but at least they have normal names that people can pronounce. My book of poetry is dedicated to my nephew, Todd, who is a poet himself, and I have a poem about my nephew, Kurt. He's four now. He was uh, a little over one when I wrote this. At the very top of the tornado slide, my year-old nephew's body goes limp. As one dangling foot slips through the stair grate, I grab where I was sure his ribs used to be. His shoulder joints seem to melt as his arms slip from my grasp. I grab his leg. A minute ago, there was a knee there. Where have all his bones gone? How did he turn into a rag doll in one minute, 12 feet above the hard, cracked ground? He bucks against my arms, 12 feet above the park, deciding this slide was not his idea, as if he did not scream until we climbed the 25 steps, one baby foot by one baby foot, the line of children backing up behind us. All I can picture now is his limp little body slipping from my grasp to plummet 12 long feet to the cold, hard ground. But I hold my ground. I can't fall back with him down 25 steps. There's no place to go but around down the slide. I push his limp little feet front, grab his solid little chest, and we swirl down the curve. At the ground, miraculously, he's found his bones. He stands solid on his white-topped shoes. His red-striped shirt breathes in and out with his giggles as he heads back up the 25 steps. <laughs> Kids. The first poem I, re I read was about autumn, and I think I'll read a spring poem next. This is called Equinox. You may need to know a little history about this. At the time of the equinox, you can balance an egg on end. I've done this. I've proven it. I didn't bring my pictures. Um, in fact, this last equinox, I had my students at school all had eggs balanced up on their desks. And there's a story that it was about Columbus. That there was a, some sort of a bar bet. Someone bet him that he couldn't stand an egg on end. And since it wasn't equinox, of course he couldn't. And the egg kept flipping over. And so he took his knife and cut the end off of it and <laughs> slammed it down on the bar, and then it stood on end. But this is Equinox. I've left the TV on to a documentary about the Ice Age for the bird, but outside there is no ice on this first day of spring as I rake the mulch from the garden. The mulch is really just the leaves that fell last autumn unraked, but it covered the strawberries, a protection against the inches of snow that melted late in the shade of the house. And the soil is richer now, for the broken leaves and the graveyard of goldfish buried where the tomatoes go, or in the strawberry patch, or the where the leaves already poke up green, or where I'll try zucchini again. I'm ready with packets of seeds, squash, carrots, lettuce, and columbine for a splash of color in the shade and a remembrance of the mountains. The rich, dark, fishy smell of new spring soil fills my nostrils and covers my hands when I pull the carcasses of last year's tomato plants, the tiny eggs of nursery foam still clinging to the soil around their roots. And that night at 9.02, as somewhere far south the sun crosses the equator, 
I balance an egg standing on its own power, not like Columbus's trick, but on the Earth's own perfect equilibrium. Going along with gardening, I am not a very good gardener. I try. I really try. I cannot get zucchini to grow. Everybody I know plants one zucchini plant, and they have more than they can handle. I have zucchini space aliens. The flowers come out, the leaves are big, and then one day the plants are gone. They've disappeared. They have completely, it's got to be zucchini space aliens. This year I planted the garden on the front porch in pots. There was nowhere for it to go, so I got some herbs. This is a cestina um, about gardening called Garden Cestina. I can't explain my need to garden. My thumbs have never been green. I could never keep a philodendron alive. I've dried out all my house plants. My mother never gardened, so it must be from my past to my farming ancestors. The generations who lived on the land, generations of farmers, of grandmothers who needed their gardens to feed their families. The canned vegetables from my past, jars of red beets, yellow squash, green beans, women bending to pull weeds from good plants, knowing it was these tomatoes that would keep the family alive. But I don't need these plants to live, no children to save, no future generations dependent on my success with plants. But still, I spend hours in the garden watering, weeding, waiting for the first green sprouts to connect me with the Earth's deep past. And now, for the fourth year, when the frost is past, I find myself drawn to seed racks, to live peppers and tomatoes in supermarket parking lots, green under a tent. Different from the starter boxes of generations ago, but the results are the same. The uneven rows of my garden, rich brown dirt waiting for sprouts, cages holding up tomato plants. And I grow to love these plants. The vacations I've passed up to weed and water the garden, the worms I've picked off to keep the plants alive, mulching to keep the next generation of strawberries, dragging out the green garden hose to keep the zucchini green, their leaves the size of my hand, bullying the other plants. I'm part of the generations of people who work the land. Like all gardeners past, chasing kids and birds from the strawberries, living for my taste of that red gem from my own garden. Somehow this garden has turned my blood green. I've become a part of my past, the next generation still living among the plants. Keeping in a family vein, this is fireflies. Grandmom sways on the porch swing, repeating gossip about people I don't know. Mr. Mackey hurt his back and lost his job. The glass girl down the road's getting married always was a flighty thing. I push the swing too hard. She purses her lips but doesn't make me slow down. The locusts drone from the walnut trees beyond the front sidewalk broken into a thousand cracks to avoid while I gather the round green nuts and jump to grab a handful of red black fruit from the mulberry tree. At the first flash from the yard, I beg to catch the fireflies, and Grandmom forces an old screwdriver through the lid of a perfectly good mason jar. I chase the sparks through the yard, around the bushes, into the garden, filling the jar with light, but not brave as Karen Simmons, who smears the bugs on her finger, a glowing ring. When the dark deepens in the bushes and around the trees, Grandmom calls me in where garden fresh raspberries are waiting in a bowl of cream, and she lets me turn off the light in the kitchen to watch firefly reflections dance glimmering across the milk. The first poem I remember writing, I was about in fourth grade, although I think I was writing poetry sooner than that. I, I started making uh, poems and stories as soon as I could write. The first little short story I have was when I was in kindergarten, and I have a short story about the Easter Bunny. But the first poem I wrote was in fourth grade, and it was called Giant Thunder, and my mother thought it was great, and my grandmother thought it was wonderful, and wanted me to write poems for everything, for all the holidays, for family birthdays. I was the poet laureate of the family, and wrote tons of these horrible rhyming doggerel poems about family birthdays and holidays and occasions. And the last one I wrote like that was for my grandparents' 40th anniversary, and they love it, and they have it framed in their living room. And um, my grandmother was very disappointed when I started writing free verse. <laughs> but what, I, what happened with that was I got the experience of writing in a lot of forms using rhyme. And even though I choose not to, to write using rhyme now, I've got the experience and I can do it if I want to, and I have. I've written a couple sonnets 
just recently. So I was very, my family was very supportive about my riding from the time I was 10 years old. I, you know, everyone said, oh, Tammy's such a good poet. And so I had no reason to ever doubt that. And it made it easier for me when I went into college and went into graduate school to say, well, of course I'm a poet. What else would I do? And most of the poetry I write is based on the things I do every day, driving back and forth to Omaha. I feel like I live on the interstate since I live in Lincoln and I work in Omaha. So there are a lot of commuting poems of the things I see on the road and the process of driving along. Um, I realized this afternoon that all my manuscripts were in my office at Creighton, so I had to have them couriered in. My parents broke into my office. I had called security and let them in so I would be able to have new poems to read. And one of them is Yellow Autumn. Autumn is my favorite time of year. The first yellow days of autumn are still the bright, warm yellow of the summer sunflowers, standing tall in the ditches, drooping slightly their heads. Then the colors cool subtly. One day, the soy fields are dappled yellow like the sun dancing, making green leaf shadows. And the tree outside my window turns yellow on the leaf tips first, green still dark in the veins. The locust tree outside the church stays dark at the center, while the tips burst into gold, like the golden shutters on the steeple, bright as St. Peter's stained glass cloak. And the next day, the wind is filled with the dying scent of yellow leaves, smoky and yellow as incense. I commute every day from Lincoln to Creighton, so I feel that I spend most of my time on the interstate. I should use that as my permanent address. And I've written a lot of poems about traveling and about commuting, and this is Atlas. I trace the states I've traveled. Start dead in the middle, Nebraska, pale yellow like the wheat. All fall, the goldenrod paled, the river slashing blue, brighter than the sky, reflecting low in the shallow plat, shadowed by the interstate, double lanes, red as the Niobrara grass in autumn, across to Colorado orange. There is no orange like that in Colorado, not in the dark greens of the Rockies, capped snowy white, even at sunset, stained icy pale, not in the soft tans of the Pueblo pockmarked cliff dwellings, not in the green-gray plains, sagebrushed toward Wyoming, the perfect green for the miles of brush, miles of gray land, flecked gray, green with sage, tumbleweeds circling around and around, around to South Dakota, pink as the sky over the Badlands, reflected in the layers of pink patches through the canyons, miles past where the hills turn black to the bright green of Iowa, brighter than any of the fields, greener than the somber colors of Amana, gray dresses against leaf green fields, to Missouri violet, twilight in the city, buildings mirrored violet, crossing the river by mistake, moving so smoothly into Kansas, I didn't even notice the world had turned yellow gold. Oh, we might as well stay on travel poems. I went down to New Orleans a few years ago, and I must have looked seriously like a tourist. I walk out on Bourbon Street where my Louisiana t-shirt and a camera around my neck, just begging someone. It's like I'm, I've got a sign, please con me. And first thing, I got into Bourbon Street, and a guy comes up and says, I bet you I know where you got your shoes. I said, what? And he said, no. He says, I shine shoes for a living. I know these things. I'll bet you I know where you got your shoes. And I said, what do you mean? He says, I'll tell you what. He says, if I can guess where you got your shoes, I'll shine, I'll, you'll, you'll give me two bucks and I'll shine your shoes. If I'm wrong, I'll shine them for free. And I'm thinking, oh, right. There's a, there's a trick here, but I couldn't figure it out. And I was intrigued. So I said, OK, go for it. And he said, all right, now listen, I didn't say, I know where you bought your shoes. He says, I know where you got your shoes. You got your shoes on your feet on Bourbon Street in New Orleans, Louisiana. And I thought, oh, that's so good. So it was worth the two bucks. And I, I tell that little story to my students every semester as an example of someone who is using language for his own best interest. And I wrote a poem about it, too, so I got double duty. Bourbon Street. 
I bet you I know where you got your shoes. Old bearded man wipes his brow against the heat, his hand outstretched. The New Orleans blues pours from the nightclubs. The sign flashes booze, the smoky smell of beer, the jazz, the beat. I bet you I know where you got your shoes. Give it a try. What have you got to lose? The scent of shrimp, doormen call, eat here, the Cajun spice and the New Orleans blues. Whole shrimp, heads and tails, bubbles and brews, raw oysters, red shrimp to peel and eat. I bet you I know where you got your shoes. It can't be real, it has to be a ruse. I can tell you the city, the state, and the street. He's got me hooked on the New Orleans blues. I bet you two dollars, I'll shine your shoes. You got them in New Orleans on your feet. I bet you I know where you got your shoes. Two dollars lost, the New Orleans blues. I thought it was worth it. My grandparents winter in Mexico, and when I go down to visit them, we go to the border towns, which is an experience, although you can get a lot of cool stuff cheap. This is Mexico Sestina. The world is different across the bridge. The breeze from Mexico tastes dusty. From beneath the barbed wire fence along the river, children run, yelling to the tourists. They call nickel man, nickel lady, nickel. I throw my change. No penny, nickel lady. Vendors on the street play toy violins, yell tablecloth lady, hammock lady. They bridge the cloth between their hands. A boy hands me gum for my nickel. Old women in the shop sweep the dirt floors dusty. Good clothes lady, tablecloth lady, the shopkeepers call. Outside the shop, a young woman holds a cup. Two little children sleep on the sidewalk beside her. I put in two quarters for the children. Their mother smiles. Gracias, lady. The shops are dark. How much, I call, holding a statuette, a stuffed frog fishing off a bridge. Four dollar. I try to rub the dust from its head. Three fifty, lady, take it. Three a nickel. I buy it at two ninety five. I want the nickel to cross the river to throw to the children. I buy tequila soza, the bottle dusty. There's no bargaining for the booze, no good deal, lady. The prices are cheap enough, despite the tax booth at the bridge. On the streets again, a garlic vendor calls me to buy purple garlic on a rope. Shine shoes, a boy calls. Spring breakers pay boys five nickels to carry cases of beer across the bridge. The boys put the cases on their heads. The other children swarm around. Buy gum, buy candy, buy gum, lady. The little girls in red lace dresses, tangled hair and bare feet dusty. Winter Texans stop for happy hour, their throats dusty at the mariachi bar. Play yellow rose, they call to the organist. He smiles for the lovely ladies. They dance, they laugh, put in another nickel, dance to El Paso. They gather their change for the children, stop to buy a bottle of scotch, yell meet y'all at the bridge. Clutching tequila with dusty fingers, I go back across the bridge. Again, I hear the calls from the ragged children. I throw a handful of change, raining into their shouts. Nickel lady, nickel, nickel lady. That stuffed frog illusion there. In Mexico, they have their real frogs. They, I don't know where they get them. They're real frogs, and they, they're dead, and they shellac them and stuff them with sawdust or something. The first year my mother went over there, she brought me back this dead frog playing a harp. And I'm a vegetarian. I said, Mother, you know how I feel about dead animals. And she says, oh, but it's so cute. And look, it's playing a harp, just like you do. So I, I have a dead frog playing a harp on, on my TV set now. Let's read Fear of Flying. Oh, I hate to fly. I fly when I have to. I fly to Texas. I, I flew to Europe. I flew to New Orleans. I flew to Florida. And every time I do it, I hate it. I, I get airsick. I worry about crashing. Um, and so the last time I thought, well, if I'm going to be this miserable, I might as well get a poem out of it. I don't think it's death I'm afraid of. It's that split second before. I picture us all like dominoes, business travelers sturdy in their suits and briefcases, computers filling their laptops, intent only on their paperwork, students noisy, flying south for the break, try to wheedle underage alcohol from the stewardesses, mothers anxious with toddlers juggle toys and bottles and crayons to ward off cries with promises of grandparents at the airport when we land. Real people stacked seat to seat, the plane dips, the dive uncorrected, the cl clouds rushing up past the windows, the ground looming closer, the air growing thicker, the worried face of the stewardess, honey peanuts in her hand, worry running down the aisle, stomach to stomach, composures falling like dominoes, that terrible moment. It's not the death. 
It's the knowing that everything must be packed into this one last moment, the knowing that everything now will be left unsaid. It's not the eternity past the ground. It's the moment just before, so full of unrealized possibility. Ooh, even reading that poem scares me. I, I was influenced by the romantic poets, by Keats. I have a poem about Keats that I can read tonight. When I went to England um, in 83, I saw the Keats manuscript, Ode to a Nightingale, and fell in love with the whole idea of manuscripts and wrote the sonnet about that. Um, I'm influenced by some of the more modern poets, and Sexton particularly, and uh, her use of metaphor, Sylvia Plath. Um, I try very hard to emulate their poetry and not their life. Um, I like I like William Carlos Williams, and and his minimalist ideas. I I tend to write short poems and get as much into a short poem as I can. So grab wonderful um, images and do it in a short poem instead of going on for four or five or six pages. Not all of my poetry teachers have approved of that, but that seems to work for me. I also teach literature at Creighton. I teach a little bit of everything, creative writing, literature, composition. And um, although I wrote this when I was at Doan, but um, thinking about the literature, I kind of like to think beyond the literature. One of my favorite games to have students play in, in discussion is to say, OK, what happened next after the end of the story? The story's in, and that's all we've got. And I'm more interested in, in what these characters are doing now. And so this is after the Odyssey. Penelope waited 20 long years for Odysseus to return from the war, ever faithful, always loyal, believing against the odds that he was not dead in Neptune's locker, resisting the temptation of the suitors for 20 celibate years, and Odysseus did return. But after that first tempestuous night of feasts and orgies and sex, could they return to their family life of 20 years ago? After 20 years of sleeping alone, could she learn to share the covers, readjust herself to his snores and that horrible grinding of his teeth and the way he talks in his sleep of Circe yelling, pigs, they're all pigs. And the next morning, as Penelope serves him eggs and the exotic fruits he's become accustomed to through his travels, though she's come to prefer toast and tea, she asks, who's Circe? And what do you mean? I'm only loving you to save my men from swine. Her days, once quietly spent alone with her needlework, are filled now with visitors to Odysseus. They stay late into the evening as Odysseus recounts his travels. Every day, the Cyclops gets bigger and Odysseus more clever. Penelope is back and forth from the kitchen with mead and sandwiches and cakes. The next morning, after another sleepless night filled with his drunken moans, she looks at him over his expensive imported guava and says, Calypso, eh? You lived with her nine years as a husband while I fought off a hundred suitors denying myself so you could gallivant through the seas and live nine years with a mistress? And all he could do was mutter about the curses of the gods and the lotus eaters who numbed his mind against her and how Neptune flung him back ashore each time he sailed for home. He said, it really wasn't my fault, you know. It was all totally beyond my control. But 20 years was a long time, and though she'd been loyal and true in thought and deed, she knew how hard it was for a man alone at sea for 20 years. She could almost forgive the affairs. The visitors would soon grow bored with the exotic stories. She'd sent the maid for a separate set of blankets for the bed. But the worst of it was the way when they were joined together in passion, as he was reaching his peak, she'd find he was softly humming the song of the sirens and gazing longingly, lovingly, not at her face, but out the window toward the sea. Ah, I turned right to it. On the same literary vein, notice how I'm segueing all these together. When I was um, in England, I went to England as a school trip in, oh, years ago, 83 now. Um, one of the things I was most impressed with were the manuscript rooms. In the British Museum, they have whole rooms of manuscripts, and they're the actual pieces of paper that the poets wrote their poems on with their, in their own handwriting with the scratch-outs and the notes. 
and they have manuscripts from from authors and poets and composers and I saw manuscripts of all of these people that I had read in class and I got to see the pages they touched in their own handwriting and I was very impressed by that so when I got back I wrote um, about seeing the Keats manuscript it was at the Fitzwilliams Museum in Cambridge uh, that I saw the manuscript of Ode to a Nightingale and when I got back I kept trying to write it and nothing was falling into place and I was trying to write it in free verse the way I normally write poetry and it just wasn't working so I went back and read Keats and read the Ode to a Nightingale and Keats wrote a sonnet called On Seeing a Lock of Milton's Hair and I thought that was a very strange thing to write about, although I thought probably no stranger than writing about seeing a Keats manuscript. So I thought it needed his own form, so I wrote this in a sonnet form on seeing a Keats manuscript. Intent upon the paper in the case, I study every word, each flourish and line of the manuscript. My face pressed close, I read these words in Keats' own hand. Keats touched this page, he wrote this word, the solitary poet sitting frail beneath the plum tree, soothed by the bird, wrote down Ode to a Nightingale. Despite the crowds, the guards all watchful eyes, the distance of the case, still I see the bird whose haunting voice fills the sky, the poet listening melancholy as the hills and woods with music ring. In the museum, I hear a nightingale sing. This is sort of in a sestina form, except there's only five lines, and so I don't know if there's a name to this form. I've been calling it alternately a pentina, which would be five, and something else. What did I have? Uh, anyway, it's because of the five points of the star, I wanted five lines and used the same words. This is the Christmas star. Was it a conjunction of Earths, of planets, Jupiter and Venus high in the air, or the supernova of a sun shooting its fire? It doesn't matter. Its light flowed like water, whatever it was. The star portended a spirit. The star was the symbol, the birth of the spirit, the link between heaven and earth, a baby in a trough meant for animals' water. And in the light of the star, in the bright air, the voices of angels burst like fire. Brilliant as the star's fire was the glow of the spirit, making like day the clear night air, beaming its allegiance to the earth, its light like raindrops shining down like water. As life-giving as water, burning fierce as fire, solid as earth was the advent of the spirit, radiating through the winter air, connecting all. The star high in the air, its light as clear as water, its gleam as brilliant as fire, its meaning, the love, the spirit, made flesh and come to earth. I send that out in my Christmas cards. Here's another winter poem. This is Wolf Moon. I remember another moon like this one, the coldest time of the year, the time when wolves would come near the town for warmth to kill for meat now lacking in the frigid forest, the moon of the wolf. That first moon, the night was bitter cold, 69 below and chilling winds. The sands at the beach had frozen and our footsteps crunched like stepping through crusted snow to the frozen lake where the clear wolf moon reflected in solid waves on the white capped ice. And now, a seven year cycle, the wolf will wax to full, its biting winds howling lonely through my heart, then wane to candle mass, my single flame, a cold glow, and the dark of the new snow moon. Some of my friends who wanted to be here tonight couldn't because of work schedules and stuff, so this next section will be, I guess, poems to absent friends. This is Conductor. My friend the Conductor is on the train now, but he said he would watch the video. Before you come, I hear the whistle blow the crossing. I wait. You, wearing your cap, carrying your grip, smell faintly of diesel fuel and kerosene. You tell me of watching from the cupola fields filled with fireflies, walking the train in the siding, switching cars in Crete. When I drive you to the station, we watch the train roll by, 
first the engines, then the freight cars gathering speed, till you climb onto the caboose, moving away, and wave to me from the platform. I follow the train to Sutton to hear the crossing whistle, see you waving from the cupola, see your cap in the cupola, see you waving. And the next poem I will read is Wizardry. I woke today with a cat sleeping on my head, her tail curled around my ear. He is still sleeping beside, softly breathing spells into the pre-dawn air. But even after he wakes and leaves for the day, the scent of incense will remain and curl, t curl around me twice before lying down again to sleep. Last night, he looked into a crystal of fluorite and saw a story, a maiden on a white horse calling to a wizard, come ride with me beside the cool waters. I dreamt of candle flames reflecting off amethyst, cool violet fire. Can he weave me a spell of forgetfulness? How can I climb over the old pains? When I write, the cat familiarly reads over my shoulder with her yellow eyes. And when he calls, the candles dance, and I'm enveloped in incense. While I was teaching, I would write along with my students, with the creative writing students when I taught intro to creative writing and intro to poetry. I would give them certain poetry assignments and write poems along with them. And if I would require my seniors to write so many pages a week, I wouldn't always write that many pages, but I would write with them. But when I'm writing the poems, I'm writing it more, I think, for myself and for the emotions and for the words. And then after it's written, then I want to show it to everybody and worry about getting it published and worry about what else to do with it. But it's, it's, it's hard to think about audience when I'm in the middle of it. Um, rejection slips are devastating. I've, I've almost gotten inured to them, but not quite. Every day when I, I get a rejection slip, I think, oh, no. <laughs> but then I send them back out again and put them back in an envelope and send them out again. And I, I tell my students if they're in love with it and that's what they have to do, then they should do it. And my seniors last year, one of the students wrote a poem that had a good line in it that's, that reminded me somehow of, of um, bikers. And so their assignment the next week was to write a biker love poem. And this is my biker love poem. Your love rides on my thoughts like your black leathered hips ride on the saddle of your hog, smooth on the rump-worn leather. Fits nice. I hug you as tight as your tattoo hugs the skin on your thick arms, the muscles taut holding firm to the handlebars. I feel the power of the bike between my legs, feel the speed in the wind that whips my hair back and closes my eyes and rips the words from my mouth before they can reach your ears. I bury my face in your black leather jacket to keep behind the wind, and when we dismount, the embossed Harley Eagle is burned like a tattoo onto my cheek, marking me as surely as if I were yours. That's just fiction, Mother. One of my favorite places in the world is Colorado. And in fact, I'm applying for jobs in Colorado, basically so I can live there and move there and go mountain climbing for the rest of my life. Now I go out for about a week if I can manage it, normally in the summer. And this is Colorado clouds. A hundred years, a hundred <laughs> miles before the mountains, they appear on the horizon, misty as clouds. In fact, I think they're clouds. They don't look substantial enough for mountains. I could see right through them. They can't be rock covered with trees and moss and streams. Then the sun shines off a snow cap, and I know they're real. They become solid on the horizon, and suddenly it seems I'm there, inside, mountains, behind, and still in front, until they're everywhere I look, surrounding me. The sky becomes a circle. There is no horizon, only mountains, like walls up to the blue sky ceiling. There is no flat, only rocks crawling up as far as up. Pines twisted into cracks on the stones reaching for a piece of sky, and the circle of sky is filled to brimming with clouds tall as the mountains, brimming over mountains, bursting right over the edge of rocks. 
amid these mountains now, I forget the fat, flat places I came from. The world is vertical now, and I'm on top, looking down into valleys, watching eagles catch the breeze through the cliffs, hiking through forests lost in trees, pines, and aspens, and looking up to mountains, down to ground, below the ground I walk on. Coming back, I always watch until they lose their form, become misty as clouds again behind. The world becomes flat as a circle again, and up ahead, in the wrong direction, the clouds low on the horizon, sunlit, look so real, I swear I could drive right to them, look so much like mountains. It's always so depressing coming home again after that. I love being here. It's just, it's hard to leave the mountains every time I do. One of the nice things about being here is the sandhill cranes who come into, um, around the area around Grand Island. Uh, I think they come in twice a year. I see them mostly in the spring. They say it's easier to find them in the spring. We'll get to see how well I can do bird impressions when we get to the end of this. Sandhill cranes. The cranes come back in March. Not a particular day like the swallows each St. Joseph's Day to Capistrano, but bird by bird, sometime over the first few weeks in March, until suddenly, it seems, the fields are alive with them. The fields are moving, a brown-gray river of wings rustling. They hop on spindly legs, wing arms waving an erratic dance. And as the sky turns dark away from the sun, the air grows thick with the silhouettes of a thousand cranes, necks outstretched toward the night field, warm with a thousand other cranes striping a brown-gray band through the golden stubble of cornfield or the bright green of winter wheat. The sky dark in the south, silver wings dark against the sky, dark blue near the east still rose toward the west, their legs dangling awkward. When they land, those legs come down first like landing gear engaged, their wings hunched over like shoulders, and they drop right down into the smallest space amid the thousand cranes muttering in the field, wings rustling. Here and there, a male will dance, hop on twig-like legs, arms flapping, the field alive with the sound of a thousand cranes, crrr, 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 singing themselves to sleep. That was my crane impression. I'm a vegetarian, so I don't eat fish, but um, I have a friend who likes to go fishing. And so we would go out fishing on his boat. I like to go out on the boat. And he would catch fish. And as he caught the fish, I would name them and give them little personalities as he brought them into the boat. And then he felt so bad that he couldn't eat them, so he would throw them back. Come to think of it, he doesn't take me fishing anymore. <laughs> Maybe he got hungry. This is naming the fish. No rain tonight. The dipper holds its water. But before dawn, the bear will turn head over heels and water can pour from the heavens. The lake is calm as you bait your hook. Shore lights skate to us across the ripples. Fires of the shore fishers flicker orange near the dam. I named the fish you catch. The first one's not a keeper. He cries as you hold his gills, mews as you ease the hook from his mouth. I call him Skippy before you slide him over the side. The half-full moon slides silver drops, a shimmering trail across the water. Next week, the moon will be a rose flower. The next fish bites hard. You fight him in. I call him Dave. You use pliers to pry the tri-barb hook from his mouth before you toss him wriggling into the lake. When Orion's up, Scorpio's not. The gods promise these earthly enemies, the hunter and the scorpion who killed him, separate sides of the sky, never to meet in the heavens. Your line jerks hard. You let it bite, play itself out. It nibbles. You pull too fast. It swims away, nameless. I was born in Nebraska. I was raised here. I've never really lived anywhere else, so I don't have that other experience. I, I don't have anything to compare it with, except that I know a lot of my poetry deals with the area. Like I said, I. I drive back and forth from Lincoln to Omaha every day. A lot of the poetry deals with that experience, driving on the interstate and seeing all the farm fields. A lot of my poetry has a flatland feel to it. I also love the mountains. I go to the mountains, and I think I could live here forever. And then I come back to Nebraska, and I think, gee, it's flat. But it's, you know, it's not that bad. Um, it's, it's, hard, it's hard to say how 
how being from a certain place affects me, except that, you know, this is the only experience I've had. So it's got to show up in the poetry that um, a lot of the poetry deals with the places, deals with the people of Nebraska. Most of my ancestors are from around the area. My grandparents are from Missouri. And so that's that whole um, simple nature of farm, farm people, flatland shows up in the poetry. It has to. That's who I am. This next poem is just way weird. I was studying for comprehensive exams and was reading all sorts of creative writing criticism that after about three in the morning all swam into each other. And I read this quote by a guy named Louis Zukofsky. And to tell you the truth, I, I, think, I think he was into something called vorticism. But I, I, can't, I can't say for sure. And he was talking about how if you write something in a poem, that whatever the character is, it has to have its own characteristics. So you can't make an object do things it wouldn't normally do. He said, I come into a room and I see a table. Obviously, I can't make it eat grass. And it was 3 in the morning, and I thought, why not? This is table grass. You can drag a table to a pasture, but you can't make it eat grass. But why, then, is the grass cropped so short around the table? Patches bare of grass around the legs, color moving slowly up the legs, staining the wood green, dark as a forest near the feet, color moving up toward the top in waves like the sea, dark in the grain. The table's already eaten all the grass at its feet. Are there teeth in the table legs? Do the table leaves brush the grass toward the center, little green teeth chewing as fast as the grass grows? Hmm. You never know. A more realistic view of grass is prairie grass. When I was at Doan, they have what they call the Arboretum of Native Nebraskan Plants. And they have all these prairie grasses out in a little area, all in little five-gallon buckets. And it just didn't seem natural to me. Outside my office is the Arboretum of Native Nebraskan Plants. Twelve buckets set in the gravel-topped ground, boxed in by railroad ties. Each bucket holds a separate isolated plant, each plant identified with common and Latin name embossed on a tin marker. And I can't help thinking how sad it all is. This big blue stem growing six feet tall on its reedy stem towering over me, separated by gravel and a bucket from the little blue stem, from the Indian grass. But in the prairie, they all grow together, the big blue stem genuflecting deep in the wind, its three-pronged turkey-footed seed heads bowing low, the Indian grass all standing together in clumps like hunting parties rust-colored on the hills and on the sides of the hills, their leaves curling across their heads as they look far into the horizon, over toward the thicket of plums where the grass grows short in the shade, short strands of buffalo grass where even the little blue stem, pink and short, just up to the knees of the big blue stem is too tall to grow. The switch grass fills in the flat, flat pace places with broad cream-colored leaves, its heads almost invisible at first in the sun. And I know that underground, all the roots are growing 10 feet below the surface, searching deeper for groundwater, branching root veins around the moisture in the soil, holding the earth firmly in their strong web. And outside my office, I notice the buffalo grass on stringy spindles like strawberries, creeping out of its bucket, new shoots taking root around the gravel, crawling across into the bucket reserved for the partridge pea. Of course, they probably wouldn't allow that to continue. This fits the topic, too. This is land. The plains are not flat any more than the ocean is. The hills roll in swells. Wheat bows down in waves to break against the ditches in weeds crashing against the shoulder rocks. They are not still any more than the sky is. The grasses are alive, always billowing and swirling. The wind break cottonwoods tall as thunderheads, pines whispering like nimbus. 
They're not playing any more than a person is. The road can't hold down the hills. The road itself crawls with cracks and patches. The fences can't hold in the fields. Wildflowers spring up in fence rows. Corn sprouts tall in a field of beans. This land is not quiet any more than the air is. Telephone lines are tangled with one bird or clumps of birds, bringing disorder to these lines, swinging the world in a cat's cradle, trying to tie some order to this land. This next poem is Jogger, and I'm not a jogger, to tell you the truth. I'm, I'm taking yoga now, and that's as strenuous as I can get. Although I used to know somebody who wanted me to run with him, and we did it once. It didn't work out very well, but I got a poem out of it. So you should always do these experiences. You never know when they're going to come in handy. This is Jogger. When we jog together, you show me how to stretch out, pulling one leg behind into an archer's bow, aiming my nose down for the target toe, how to hold up a wall, then slowly pull my heels down, drawing a line from the wall through me to the ground. You show me how to run on the balls of my feet, like tiptoes, only faster, like a child's game. Step on your heel, make your mother squeal. Then we jog until pain slices my side, pulls up my ribs, until my gasps slow us to a sharp walk. Today you had to work late, so I pulled on my old gray sweats, drawstring hanging, and my navy Colorado Eagle t-shirt, laced my Nike cross trainers with thinner soles than your New Balance runners to run our route alone. After three blocks, I took a path through the park and let my heels down to hear the leaves crackle brown and rust. I stopped in the playground without running in place, then sat on a swing to watch the black bare branches dance across the almost sunset sky. I jumped from the swing. I'm not a jogger. I'm just another poet who can't resist the rustle of fallen leaves or the design of trees against pink clouds. I walked slowly home. When you called, I said, I went for a run, but my time wasn't good. This next poem is Hurricane. Two days after Hurricane Hugo tossed ships inland from their piers, pulled trees and power poles from the ground, the ghost of the three-quarter moon pulls those winds all day across the plains. Tall trees bend down before the moon shadow, touch their leaves to the wind-blown fields. The last remnants of the harvest moon pull what crops remain from their sheaths. Ditch bushes don't bow down. They fight the wind, twist and turn in its grip. They lift an arm slapped back down with a branch, lifted and dropped by the winds. They dance like marionettes. Even the coon, three days at the roadside, ruffles his fur against the wind, lifts a stiff paw, greeting last night's moon. In the fluttering milo field, blackbirds rise up a cloud, then settle back down, a checkered board against red field tops. Green leaves torn loose from pre-autumn trees hurl green stones at the transparent moon. But the moon does not return to the night. It keeps reaching for the rain pulled from Carolina's 10-foot tides found it. This is the poem I want to end with. January Skyscape. Orion, hunting low on the horizon, his crystal belt bright in the clear dark sky, his regal shoulders broad. Canis, his serious-eyed dog, following close behind along the frozen river. Even in the heavens, he kills wild beasts to protect his beloved arrow, then brings her the pelts, as now the hunter and his dog heading home against the winter sky, and farther back, their kill, the half-wolf moon, its lifeblood spilling out, staining red, the icy river hardened to silence. Thank you.